Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from the Big Easy is my friend and colleague, Sean Michael Chick. Hello there, Sean. How's it going? Oh, hello. Just, uh, you know, busy with the uh, season and uh, uh, tours and whatnot. Uh, you know, we're all uh, waiting for the big storm to come in Wednesday. Oh, that's right. You'll be uh, socked in there, won't you? Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be pretty bad. Uh, so may not even be able to work that day. But, you know, so... That's pretty much that. Been back to work on Shiloh finally after a little uh, pause there. So, uh, well, good luck weathering the storm and uh, good luck in the uh, fields of Southwest Tennessee. So <laughs> I've asked you to join me to talk today about the capital of Tennessee and your forthcoming emerging Civil War book, They Came Only to Die, The Battle of Nashville, which, of course, took place in December of 1864 in the closing days of the year. And Sean, I want to start with your title, They Came Only to Die, because it sounds awfully bleak. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a bleak battle, uh, fought in horrendous weather conditions, for one thing. <clears throat> the actual name refers to a charge made by uh, uh, USCT on December 16th against the Confederate position, which at that point the Confederate position was very strong at the point the USCT are really plowing in. There's really no hope that they have, you know, but in a broader sense also just refers almost to this entire hopeless battle in many ways, hopeless for the Confederates. And for that reason, um, you know, they're, they're essentially fighting this large battle when the war is very much already decided, you know? So in many ways, yes, in many ways, a bleak battle, a bleak campaign. So why does Confederate Commander John Bell Hood go forward with it? Um, you know, set the stage for us, because as you said, the war is pretty much decided by this point. So what is there to gain? Well, you know, in the case of Hood, he's going to he's going to do one more throw of the dice with the Tennessee invasion. Um, and his belief is that he can somehow uh, turn the tide from there. In fact, there's one remark he makes even after the Battle of Franklin that he says 1865 will be bloodier than 1864. Uh, and you keep in mind, uh, man, uh, Hood is a man of iron will and determination. So he believes that he can reverse that he can reverse all the Confederate losses by striking into Tennessee, since Sherman is taking most of his forces towards Savannah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, by doing that, that means there's really nobody to stop Sherman from doing what he's going to do, and Sherman is going to deliver in Georgia one of what I would call the three death blows of the Confederacy, which is the Battle of Nashville, the Storm of the Petersburg Trenches, and then, uh, of course, the March to the Sea. So those are really the three ones. Uh, so that's what Hood is thinking. Uh, of course, he's trying to get there before more Union forces can arrive because the troops inside of Tennessee are scattered. It's also a lot of garrison troops, but his trying to cross the river is delayed. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Tennessee River, and delayed for a number of reasons. Force was late getting there. Hood changed his position. Union forces in the area also did some good jobs disrupting him. By, by the time he's crossing the Tennessee, there's already the Federal 4th and 23rd Corps under the overall command of Schofield. And of course, Thomas has the troops that are uh, scattered throughout Tennessee and the garrisons. Those are troops that are various quality, but are mostly not going to be the best of the best for sure. And there's an army of the Tennessee detachment under Andrew Jackson Smith that is coming, which is usually dubbed the 16th Corps for this campaign. When you, when you, when you talk about um, Thomas's forces available to him, but he's also one of the most heavily fortified cities in, oh, yeah. in the entire uh, Union territory at this point, because you know the, the Federals have been occupying Nashville essentially since uh, February of 1862. So uh, you know, how important are those fortifications for him in what he's able to do with some subpar troops? I mean, if the, Hood's entire plan was to try to just get to Nashville before Schofield, and he lost the race at Spring Hill. I have, seri I, I, I have serious doubts if he even wins the race, what he can do. Now, grant the troops defending Nashville, he would outnumber them. They're not of the highest quality, but they have entrenchments and lots of heavy cannons. And even if the Confederates were going to somehow storm Nashville, they were going to suffer very heavy casualties. Also, it should be noted that Smith's Corps, 16th Corps, arrived right after Franklin. So even if Hood won the race, there's a really good chance he's going to find himself 
facing a federal force that is that has just been reinforced by hardened veterans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I there, there I actually I think there's a, a new book that's come out that argues that this campaign actually wasn't decided at Spring Hill. It was decided by the fact that Hood couldn't didn't cross Tennessee River fast enough. Mm, okay. okay. You know, and I always sort of wondered if, you know, so what if he does win the race at Spring Hill, somehow gets himself between Schofield and Nashville? It's almost like having the tiger by the tail because you yeah. know, he could be caught between two federal forces. Yeah, he could. He could if he was, and you know, he could be caught between federal two federal forces. Now, of course, those Army to Tennessee troops would have to have time to uh, to be organized, to get the supplies to them. You know, I mean, putting them in the entrenchments at Nashville is one thing; getting them ready for a major combat operation is another one. But I think you got a good point there. And it's not like if he gets between that, that Schofield's immediately doomed. Schofield has other paths to get to Nashville and Schofield himself could attack Hood. And who knows what happens then? I mean, Schofield has, I mean, 23rd Corps hasn't seen that much action, but 4th Corps is one of the very best in the Union Army. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you another, um, it's, it's sort of a hypothetical, but you know, we think about the Battle of Franklin, which takes place in the last day of November of 64, as sort of the death knell of the uh, Confederate forces because they take such heavy, heavy losses. But how important is the Battle of, of Franklin in giving Thomas some extra time before Hood's arrival? I would say that not particularly. Okay. By the time he gets to, by, by the time Battle of Franklin's being fought, uh, you know, unless some miracle happens in the attack on Franklin, Schofield is going to get to Nashville. Okay, now the attacks are launched. The Confederates do penetrate the line at one point, but the attacks are disjointed. They happen very late in the day. And of course, the days are short in December. Right. Uh, and even if somehow they had penetrated the line, the, the slaughter was still going to be horrific. There's no way they were going to get around that. And with the immense loss of uh, veteran soldiers and especially with officers as well, I mean, you start at those, there's one brigade, Granberry's Texas Brigade is going to go into Nashville led by a captain. That's wow. how bad it is. Wow. Uh, so, <clears throat> so Frank, Franklin's very important insofar as it wrecks Hood's army. Yeah. yeah. And it gives the Union forces a, uh, even though they have to retreat, of course, it, for them, it's a victory. Now, Hood, after Franklin tried to play it up as a victory, as one would try, right? You know, saying like, oh, we, we driven from the field, but, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, even even back in Richmond, Virginia, you know, I'm reading like a Gorgas's uh, diary. He deduces very early on that Hood's lying about Franklin, that actually something really bad has happened. Uh, so the um, Battle of Franklin, I think its main importance is the losses it inflicts on Hood's army. Now, Beauregard would later on say, because Beauregard was overall commander of the West, would later on say that what Hood should have done after that was simply stayed where he was, you know, hunker down for the winter, cut off the federal forces that are in Murfreesboro, Chattanooga, and the rest. And if you cut them off, that you can maybe surround them with part of your forces, force them to surrender. Um, maybe they'll surrender because they'll run out of supplies. Now, you have to look at actually how many supplies are, 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 are stockpiled there. Murfreesboro and Chattanooga were major depots, so maybe they can survive the winter. But that was that's what Beauregard thought he should do. Hood decided that to turn back or to stay stationary was to die. That he is, he knows that his, he knows the odds of victory are low. Keep that in mind too. Hood is not delusional in that regard. And so his idea is I'll just go to the gates in Nashville. By doing that, I'll boost the morale of my army, which is true. The army of Tennessee for the first few days they get to Nashville has a, a boost of morale because it's the first time they've seen the city oh, yeah. in years. Yeah, you have men who are there for the evacuation. And of course, when they're marching up there, they're being cheered all along the way. Because understand too that Nashville and the whole corridor south of it, until about Murfreesboro and even a little south of that, is very pro-Confederate. So they're being cheered the whole way to Nashville. Uh, and yeah, you read their letters or even their recollections. They'll say, "Yeah, for a few days there, I was feeling pretty good." You know, all things considered. But very soon it sets in that wait, there's not enough of us. There's a hell of a lot of them. And the weather gets colder and colder. And I'd actually probably say when that, there's a severe cold snap that hits by around December 10th. And that really hurts the morale in Hood's army because they just don't have the supplies to properly deal with it. You know, uh, and of course, it's actually, it's pretty rough on the Union Army as well. I mean, because a lot of them had to be in the entrenchments. So there are 
you know, they're, they're, they're tenting out in harsh winter conditions, you know. So even their letters and stuff are taught. It's pretty rough on them. But anyway, so Hood's thinking is get to Nashville, set up a defensive position, force the Federals to attack you, win a defensive battle, and maybe, just maybe, you can follow them into Nashville as you chase them off and rout them. That part in particular strikes me as pretty fanciful. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, this isn't bold. Yeah, as you said, like, what are his choices at this point, though? Yeah. 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 And it's also, it's, it's not bull run. You're not fighting green soldiers um, led by some generals who, by the summer of 1862, are effectively out of the war. These are battle hardened veterans. They're commanders. Sure, they may not be military geniuses, but these guys have seen a lot of action. They know what they're doing mm -hmm. overall. So, you know, I, I guess the best Hood could have hoped for was just to win a straight Fredericksburg type battle. And then you know, claim a claim a rightful victory. You know, so how, yeah, how much that yeah. improves the strategic position would be doubtful, but hey, you know, you take your wins where you can get them. Yeah. Now I think about you know after the battle, it takes him a day to get all the way back to Franklin on, on December seventeenth. But you know, after the Battle of Franklin on November thirtieth, it's two weeks before things happen as they move north. What what yep. happens in those two weeks, which seems like geographically it's a pretty close distance. Yeah, well, in the case of Hood, he, of course, can't attack right away. He does send some of his infantry off, and then especially Forrest, to go capture blockhouses, and then to try to take, they try to take Murfreesboro, which fails. They have a, not, I don't even call it a battle, I guess, like a big skirmish around there. Uh, so <clears throat> that's a failure. Hood did fortify his position as best that he could, but that becomes even harder when the ground freezes over. As far as the Union goes, they have to organize their forces because you have good men coming from disparate areas. Schofield's men definitely need to rest after fighting a battle and doing all this marching. And they need to get their cavalry ready. So they're trying to round up as many horses as possible. Uh, the guy overseeing this course is James Wilson, who will lead the cavalry. Uh, Thomas essentially, George Thomas, the Union commander, essentially decides that if he's going to attack Hood, he wants to have cavalry set up that can pursue Hood. Um, and I think that's a very, very wise choice there. And also the, the Army of the Cumberland in particular, I would say, and you know, Thomas, of course, being like you know, the, their main guy, the Army of the Cumberland really understood the use of cavalry early on uh, because William Rosecrans had spent 1863 improving the cavalry under his command to the point while the summer of 1863, they can take on their Confederate counterparts and beat them. Uh, you know, one epic battle with that is the Battle of Shelbyville, where Joe Wheeler's command was routed. So Thomas's thinking is, is that it's not enough for me just to attack and drive them off. I want to be able to chase them down. And, um, you know, I'd say that actually goes back to 1863, because, you know, a lot of people talk about the Army of the Potomac's cavalry, but the Army of the Cumberland is the first one to create a cavalry force that can beat the Confederates of their own game. You know, now, they're, they're delayed, though. Be oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that I'm just delayed. very underappreciated with that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think of Dave Powell's, um, you know, book Failure in the Saddle about Nathan Bedford Forrest, and he's very critical about Forrest's performance at Chickamauga. So again, you know, talking about Rosecrans yeah. on the Union side there, and you know, the the myth of Forrest is that he's so indestructible, but he actually has some problems out there um, with with Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland's forces. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, another one, another one. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah, Dave Powell's book on Tullahoma. A lot of that is about the Federal Cavalry under Rosecrans getting better and they gain to a point where they can beat the Confederates because Rosecrans very accurately deduces that the reason that he can't advance on Chattanooga is because if he does, the Confederate cavalry will just get into his rear and destroy supply trains, which they did to Buell and which they did to him around the, and during the Stones River battle. You know, uh, so he's very correctly, very correctly saying, I need time to make sure that I can actually get to Chattanooga in the first place. Um, so Thomas, Deliberately spends his time getting his cavalry ready. Hood knows he can't attack. He sends forces to do it best they can. Like, okay, they, they put some artillery on the Tennessee River and shell boats. You know, you're attacking blockhouses all along the railroad. And at the same time, of course, uh, General Grant is seeing this and getting upset and thinking that Thomas is being slow. Mm -hmm. And almost immediately starts thinking about how can I remove him from command? Uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it's rather hypocritical <laughs> because he doesn't send those kind of messages to Sherman or Sheridan when they take their time. Yeah. 
but it's Grant. And if he has one flaw, it's that his friends can do no wrong and his enemies can do no right. You know, it's, it's and, one of and, his... And, and this, this conflict with, with Thomas has been simmering for a long time, even though Grant's the one who put him in charge of the Army of the Cumberland. Um, yeah. There's been some long-standing tension between these two guys. Mm -hmm. And there's a debate on when it really starts. Uh, I think it might go back to the Corinth campaign, mm -hmm. the Age of Corinth, because Thomas was the one who was put in command of the Army of the Tennessee, or was then called the Army of West Tennessee, which was Grant's command. And then Grant was made the second in command to Halleck and essentially had nothing to do. Right. And I probably that helped. So probably that probably that played a part. Also, uh, Thomas had a lot of friends and a lot of admirers. Men loved serving under him. He easily won the respect of fellow officers, but he himself was not a charismatic man and could be very tack turned. There's that one officer he told, uh, I forget who it was, I think it was uh, one of the, I think it was Colonel Gross. He said, uh, Colonel, I have trained myself not to feel. You know, uh, and I think in the case of Grant, uh, I think some of that, uh, that, that, that background and Thomas's personality probably played a part, you know, and <clears throat> so at any rate, though, uh, so yeah, there's an, uh, there's an entire, a lot, a, a decent portion of the book is going over Grant trying to get rid of Thomas. And one of the reasons he can't just do it outright is that George Thomas is admired. He has friends. He's popular in the papers. I mean, he's not as popular as like Sheridan at this time, but he is well liked and regarded. And, and successful. If we think yeah. about Chickamauga, we think about Chattanooga. Yeah. He's got some wins under his belt. Exactly. And, you know, Lincoln and Stanton weren't fully in his corner, but both of them were reluctant to get rid of him. I mean, they had their criticisms. They, they kind of agreed with Grant that he was a slow. And uh, another one, too, was... Uh, Grant first tried to get Halleck to remove him, but Halleck, <laughs> you know, Halleck always working through his indirect means was like, no, no, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting too. Um, one of the best stories about it is that, uh, you know, uh, Thomas essentially tells them when they're like, attack now. Grant says, attack now. He says, I can't. It's iced over. Like, he's, he's interesting. I cannot control the weather. I am not attacking when the ground is iced over. One, uh, one of Thomas's soldiers wrote, he said like, yeah, if Grant wanted us attack, he should have sent ice skates. There was no way to do it. <laughs> and eventually the order is actually given to remove Thomas and replace him with Schofield, which would be doubly insulting because Schofield and Thomas do not like each other. You know? And that goes back to West Point because Schofield was almost removed from West Point and Thomas supported him being kicked out of the academy. So... There is a lot of animosity between the two. Um, and what's going to happen is, is that the telegraph operator doesn't send the message at first. And then the messages start rolling in. We have attacked, and this is the first day of the battle. We have driven the Confederates in their first position. And then, of course, the order is rescinded. And, and tell me, how does John Logan fit in there, too? Because I understand he's you know on the way to the Army to take over. Yeah. Yeah, Logan, uh, Logan was sent over and uh, his, I believe his orders were, if you reach Louisville and Thomas hasn't attacked, you're to go down there and relieve him. So at one point it was going to be Schofield, then it was going to be Logan, and then Grant himself was going to go there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, th th this shows the degree to which Grant doesn't like and distrust Thomas. Um, although keep in mind too, he doesn't hate him like he does like Rosecrans. Mm -hmm. He would admit that Thomas was a very capable tactician and he thought him was a great defensive fighter and whatnot. So he did, he actually did have words of praise for the guy as opposed to other officers that he really hated. But um, yeah, it really shows like Grant being very uh, nervous and confused. And, you know, Grant, Grant's a very good strategist, but he does say some goofy things like, why is why if he's like if I was hood I just would have went away from Nashville and marched into Kentucky and I'm like in those conditions <laughs> you know? and with and with the and the logistics of that I mean it'd be ridiculous <laughs> but like I, like I like to say for the, the the battle in Nashville I mean if we want to talk about Grant having a, a, a high point for Grant we'll talk about Vicksburg Nashville is not granted his best <laughs> so. Thomas is finally able to attack because the weather lets up. 
what actually happens when he's finally able to move forward. What, what, what's his incentive to even go forward? Why not just let Hood sit out there and freeze? No, you got to drive him off. Yeah. I mean, it's what the country demands. I mean, the pressure is on him. He does want to, Thomas does want to follow his orders. I mean, he, Thomas is, um, I would never, I wouldn't say Thomas is a very aggressive commander, but he is not cautious by any means. Okay. I would say prudent favoring aggression. Okay. And Thomas is supremely confident going to the battle. He told James Wilson, he said, why are they treating me like I'm a, like a schoolboy doesn't know war? He says, they just let me fight the battle I'm going to fight. I will win. And his plan is very good. It is to attack Hood's flanks, right and left, concentrate on the left flank. And he was using his cavalry as the flanking force to get into the Confederate rear to cut them off. So that is what he's hoping to do. Uh, the attack on December 15th, the attack on the Confederate right flank was done by General Stedman. Stedman commanded mostly garrison troops. Also, um, these weird regiments, what they were made up of was men who were in transit to go rejoin Sherman's army, but they can't because the railroads cut off because of good. So they're just, you know, these are guys who arrive in Nashville who are like, well, I'm supposed to be going south, but I guess I'm not. So they form them into these like ad hoc units. So that attack happens. The main attacking force is a brigade of USCT. Uh, this is, uh, the, the attack is a complete failure. The Federals uh, don't suffer like crippling casualties, but heavy enough casualties. Um, this is not the USCT's finest moment, by the way. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind too, this is another one of these attacks that really wasn't going anywhere. But, you know, let's just say this attack did not impress anybody. Um, turn back easily. And this attack is for nothing. The Confederates at no point are worried what's going on. However, on the left flank, you have the 4th Corps, 23rd Corps, I'm sorry, 4th Corps, 16th Corps, and the cavalry all striking. Now, the Confederates are outnumbered. Their entrenchments are not exactly the best. One thing Hood did was he set up these five redoubts on the left flank. They're supposed to be detached, mutually supporting works to break up any Union attack. Um, this is this is one of Hood's biggest tactical mistakes. Mm. All it does is make sure that a lot of artillery gets captured relatively quickly, because the earthworks were too far apart in several cases. So those redoubts are overrun. The left flank starts to crumble. I mean, literally, some of the Confederate units when they're getting trying to get in a position to stop the flanking forces, they will get shelled and then just start fleeing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Union will bag hundreds of prisoners on the left flank very easily. I would say the only thing that saves the Confederate Army in that moment from being routed completely from the field is the fact that the sun sets. Uh, yeah. And so one of those darkness ends the battle and yeah, everyone yeah. catches and, their breath. And one might say, like, well, why didn't the attack happen earlier? Well, the day started off very, very foggy. So it was a bit slow to get things going. And also the, un the flanking forces had a, lar had, a, had a long route to follow to get there. Mm -hmm. But once they get there, I mean, there is nothing stopping them. They're overrunning position after position. Uh, and so, yeah, darkness ends the battle. That's what saves them at that point. And a big criticism of Hood is this is the, really the point where you should retreat. This is the confirmation that his army just can't do it. The losses at Franklin, and the harsh cold of the previous days. Uh, I mean, they're so low on artillery ammunition that the order is they, they can't even do any counter battery fire. They have to wait for uh, the Union to get close in. A lot of their horses are in horrible conditions. So one of the things that really marks the Battle of Nashville on both days is just the amount of artillery that's captured. I believe something like 60, over 60 cannon will be captured at Nashville. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, you know, not able to haul off the guns. You're talking about brigades that have only a few hundred men, um, you know, and, and in Nashville, I mean, that really, that the first day of the battle really proves the army is not capable at that point of hard combat. Uh -huh. Another thing that really hurt him too, by the way, was Hood was trying to cover as much ground as he could south of Nashville to cover as many roads as he could. So his army was also very spread out. You know, and keep in mind, he has 23,000 men. Thomas has 70,000 although only 55,000 to be used. So the rest mm -hmm. are kept in reserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
it, it sounds to me that that first day of battle really confirms Thomas's notion about how to use his cavalry. Like his his two weeks getting them together was time pretty well spent. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the cavalry even overran some of the fortifications, you know, with some of the men riding in. One of my favorite ones was the, they, they, they overran Redoubt 4, so they go for 5, and the men are tired. So actually one of the uh, colonels, I think it was a colonel, it was a colonel or a general, one of the soldiers grabbed his horse's tail and had it drag him into the fight. Wow. <laughs> you know, but, but, they're, but they're talking about, like, even though the men are tired and winded, like, they, they, they know they just overran this position. They're going to overrun the next one. Uh, there's a lot of confidence in the Union Army, especially in the cavalry and the 16th Corps. Yeah. A lot of confidence. So uh, night falls, ends the first day of fighting, but Hood, rather than retreat, decides <coughs> to consolidate and try his luck the next day. Um, yeah. Why, yep. why does he make that choice? Uh, doesn't know when to quit. Okay. <laughs> He's gone this far, right? I, I sometimes think it might be like... Um, Set aside, if you think about General John Burgoyne in the Saratoga campaign, it's very obvious after Freeman's Farm that he really should pack it up and try to get back to Fort Ticonderoga. Mm. But he's already come that far. If he retreats, he admits that he lost. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind, too, before the campaign started, Burgoyne made a bet with Charles James Fox that he would get there. Right. <laughs> and Burgoyne's a gambler. You know, famously, he was, a, he was a famous card shark at that time. So is Hood. Hood is also a notorious gambler within the army. Okay. So he's got, he's got, he's, he thinks he has a gambler's chance. And he knows if he falls back that he's saying it's over. On a more, beyond the personal level, he also has a better defensive position on the second day. A more compact line. Uh, the hills he set up on Compton Hill, which is a known as Shy's Hill. Uh, Peach Orchard uh, Hill. So he's, he's, got, he's got a better defensive position. Uh, so th th to be fair, there's that, although not much time to entrench, right? But, and so I think he thinks that maybe on the second day with compact line, they can pull things off. And maybe he also felt encouraged by the repulse of Stedman over on the right flank. You know, he's just, he could say he's grabbing his straws. But that said, I do consider this a major, major mistake. Mm -hmm. I think the first day's already proven that his army can't do this, you know. So anyway, so Hood falls back to his compact line. Uh, Thomas is going to make what I would consider one of his only mistakes, really, of the battle, is that he did not give out orders for the second day no. to everybody. He gave orders to certain corps commanders. Now, if you believe Schofield, and anything involving Schofield with Thomas, you got to be careful with. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like the guy. There's actually one passage where he says that Thomas lacked mental capabilities to calculate space and time. Man, that's harsh. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I'll, well, I'll tell you what's more harsh in Salt, though. Uh, Schofield's 23rd Corps loses less than 200 men. There are regiments in this battle lose more men than an entire corps. That's how, that's how poorly Schofield handles his troops. <laughs> wow. Wow. But if you do believe Schofield, Schofield, Schofield says, and this, this might make actual sense since Thomas didn't give orders out. So Thomas himself might have thought, Hood's packing it. He's getting out of here. And so if you believe Schofield, he went to Thomas and said, what are my orders for day two? He's not running. He says, I know the guy. And they did. He knew They knew each other in West Point very well. Right. So he said, I know him. He's not running. He's going to be there the second day. I do believe Schofield in that one, he probably did tell, because also, by the way, Thomas too, he went all the way back to Nashville to go stay at the hotel, uh, the St. Cloud Hotel. So, you know, that, that, that shows a commander is thinking, all right, I got this wrapped up. Right, right. You know, second day, it, the, the slowness of the start of the second day is simply because Thomas did not get the orders out fast enough. Uh, one thing to keep in mind too, throughout the battle, two things there's kind of mentioned about battle in Nashville. A lot of the soldiers there said it was one of the loudest battles they ever were at because the mm -hmm. Federals had so much artillery. And because they're at Nashville, so they were at a supply depot, they don't care about ammo. They don't care about gunpowder. They're just blasting away constantly. Mm. And for the Confederates, they can't do counter-battery fire. Right. But for the Confederates, they're, what accounts we do have for them, they talk about the incessant barrage. So even though the second day gets started slow, it's artillery for hours and hours. 
At the same time, this entire battle, by the way, was being watched by the residents of Nashville. They got some great photographs of that. Mm-hmm. And one officer said, because they're all rooting for the Confederates, he said, uh, never, did the, never did I fight on a, like a more grand field of battle to a more sullen audience. <laughs> so these, so you know, just two odd things for the battle, but I mentioned artillery because that's important for the second day in particular. They are constantly shelling the Confederates. And then Thomas is trying to get 23rd Corps to attack and Schofield won't. Wilson does attack. He starts driving advanced Confederate forces away and he's starting to threaten Hood's left flank. At the same time, 4th Corps attacks Hood's right flank. The attack on the right flank is the bloodiest fighting of the, of the battle. The, the Federals lost roughly 3,000 men. There's some reason to believe the USCT losses actually might've been heavier, wow. especially on the first day. But there was 3,000 men throughout both days of battle. But half of those are lost by Fourth Corps on um, Fourth Corps and Stedman's force on December sixteenth, because they attack Confederate lines that are fortified, uh, very well laid out. Um, the Confederates resist them rather easily. In fact, this gives Hood a lot of hope. Uh, Hood later on said, "When I heard about them repulsing them, I actually planned out uh, a counterattack." <laughs> but at any rate, though, those attacks by Fourth Corps. That's where you get the name of the book because of the charge of the USCT forces who suffered very heavy losses. Um, the Confederate general who wrote that was Holtzclaw who had been in every battle since Shiloh and he was overwhelmed by the carnage. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a num- there several Confederate accounts I read into where they were really impressed by the bravery shown by the USCT who were going right into them, um, right up against the entrenchments. Wow. So anyway, losses are very heavy in that sector. But those attacks are not in vain. They're heavy enough to where Hood pulled out some of his units on the left flank to go to the right. Not like December 15th. December 15th, they didn't care. December 16th, the attacks are heavy enough for that. Mm -hmm. And this is happening at the same time that Wilson is working the extreme left flank. And then John MacArthur, commanding division in the 16th Corps, informs Thomas and Smith, orders or no orders, I'm attacking. I'm tired of waiting for Schofield. And mind you, he's going to attack Compton's Hill, which looks daunting, but Compton's Hill has a problem. That's head, it's, it's got several problems. It's held by Bates' division. Now, William Bates is debatably the worst division commander in the army. Mm-hmm. Uh, several officers were they're signing petitions saying, we don't want to serve in this guy anymore. I mean, he's hated by his men. Um, and, and William Bate, I mean, he was a guy, he, he did very well at regiment command and maybe brigade command, but division, it's over his head. So you got a division that has very low morale with a commander who's not very well liked. They are constantly have been under artillery fire to the point where they have, they can't actually improve what slight entrenchments they have. So the division is not well entrenched, but also for anybody who's obsessed with Missionary Ridge, it's not on the military crest. It's too far up. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, it, you know, some of that's Bates fault, but a lot of to do with the constant artillery barrage and the fact that the position was only set up at night. So not enough time to even prepare the position. And so then MacArthur's division attacks. That leaves that great painting by Howard Pyle where you see the, the they got the mud caked on them. They got the guy with the bloody bandage. You can see the flag that's in tatters, you know. And they're all just like running up towards, running up, running, running up against uh, the Confederate lines and the Confederate lines crack and collapse. And they have collapse at the same time the left flank is starting to collapse. And it just starts a chain reaction. Um, one of the uh, Confederate brigades, a Texas brigade, Granberry's Texas brigade, best of the best in the army. Well, they had marched the right flank, they're marching back the left. And apparently their commander that day, Selkirk, saw the Union flag up on Compton Hill and said, we've lost. And then the brigade fled. Oh, wow. Collapsed right there. Yeah. yeah, so now not everybody runs, of course. Some brigades will refuse flank. Um, uh, some of the other ones will form rear guards, especially over on the right flank that was held by Stephen D. Lee's corps. Stephen D. Lee's corps, I mean, they're, I mean, some of them do run, of course, but they're not completely routed. Mm-hmm. 
and the army probably would have been run off and destroyed it destroyed but uh night had fallen but another two hours and what's already a horrible defeat was would be a disaster that napoleon would have been impressed by mm. something like austerlitz and so hood and his army retreat from the field uh uh, Sam Watkins. Sam Watkins' whole account of Nashville is great. Lots of detail. Some of his best prose is in Company H, like talking about the beauty of the night sky and winter and stuff. But he has a great line. He says, uh, trying to stop our army from running would be like trying to stop the Duck River with a net. <laughs> what a great turn of phrase. All, all is chaos. Uh, yeah, so the army routed from the field. And like I said, they lost something like well, they, they lose over 60 cannon during the campaign, but some are lost in the retreat. But I want to say during the actual battle itself, it's around 50 to 60 cannon are lost. Yeah. And then more of Wilson's cavalry plays in because that, oh, yeah. that departure from Nashville then becomes essentially a running cavalry battle and, and uh, rear guard action. Yeah, Wilson. Uh, now, now, Wilson actually does fight into the night. And there's a fun little thing. There's a development in Brentwood, Tennessee. One of the uh, subdivisions they have there actually depicts uh, the fight between Colonel Rucker of the Confederate cavalry and a Union officer. It really looks awesome. They, we got a picture in the book, but it looks great in person. Uh, so Wilson fought a running battle into the night. Next day, he attacks. Now, Wilson, Wilson loved Thomas. They got along really well. And, you know, we, we, Wilson, of course, admired Grant, was friends with him. He could be critical of Grant's tactics. And on the subject of Thomas, Wilson was very critical of how Grant treated him. But this is one of the only occasions where Wilson says, this is where Thomas screws up because he says Thomas redirected his cavalry in the wrong direction. Um, you know, Regardless of that though, Wilson's cavalry is immediately chasing them down the next day. Stephen D. Lee oversees the rear guard uh, from the Brentwood Hills down towards Franklin. So they're fight they fight over the old Franklin battlefield. And it's a running fight all the way to Winstead Hill which is where Hood's army had formed up to attack at Franklin on November 30th. Um, now, in the case of the, this would be, I consider this a federal victory insofar as they inflicted heavy loss in the Confederate rear guard, they captured a lot of cannon, but they never broke the Confederate rear guard. So in that regard, maybe you could say like a Pyrrhic Confederate victory because they took heavy losses, but they could have been worse. I, Lee himself gets wounded at Winstead Hill, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then Carter yeah. Stevenson takes over. Yeah. Uh, Carter Stevenson also is oftentimes considered one of the worst division commanders, but I did note in the book that uh, um, uh, Stevenson's high point of his career is probably on December 17th. <laughs> Everybody's got a moment, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everyone gets their moment. Yeah. So, so Hood manages to finally escape back down into Alabama. Um, pretty conclusive federal victory, but what's it mean for both sides? Once the dust settles. Yeah. Oh, one little quick note about that chase. Wilson right. continues the chase after December 17th, but, you know, weather conditions also Forrest arrives and, you know, Forrest's rear guard of the army is, is one of Forrest's high points of mm -hmm. his career. You know, uh, he wins a number of skirmishes with Wilson's cavalry, uses some really, really like uh, effective tactics. I got to say, you know, but that, that's where For Forrest on the retreat does live up to the legend. Okay. Uh, as, as the legend the legend of force as a combat commander he lives up to it on the retreat i think uh, chalmers said he thought it was Forrest's finest hour yeah. uh, but anyway so what does this whole thing mean well uh the army of tennessee is not so completely destroyed to where they are not no longer a factor at all but they are no longer capable of any major offensive operations um, the army did not suffer as much desertion as you would think but i think some of that has to do with the men broke because they were in an impossible, terrible situation. But I think any Confederate who is willing to follow Hood into Tennessee has got to be of the hardcore variety to begin with. Mm -hmm. That being said, there were some significant desertion losses. The loss of artillery is truly crippling. Uh, and of course, the loss of officers. So they eventually make their way to Corinth, Mississippi and Tupelo, Mississippi, where the army was born back in March and April of 1862, you know, on the eve of Shiloh. So they, uh, some poetic, uh, something poetic to that. 
There, of course, Hood resigns. Richard Taylor takes over temporarily. The army actually gets split up. Part of the Army of Tennessee will go down to Mobile. They'll fight at Spanish Fort in Fort Blakely, Fort Blakely being the last real battle of the Civil War. And the rest of them eventually make their way to North Carolina. But, you know, the, the, the losses suffered are, uh, are such to where the army is no longer a major factor. And because Hood never surrendered like Lee at Appomattox, you know, and rightfully and, and understandably so, because Lee did surrender Appomattox and Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia are so central to the Confederacy continuing to fight, understandably, we think more of that campaign. But this one is kind of like Appomattox in many ways, an army taken out. And also, much like Appomattox, you have cavalry being used for pursuit, being used effectively in combat. And that's, the, that's really the secret sauce that, the, that a lot of the armies bef the years before didn't have. They did not have cavalry that could fight uh, the way cavalry is meant to. You, know, you can screen, you can scout, you can raid, but finally when you get to Nashville and Appomattox, you have cavalry that can chase you down and fight in a field battle and get around your flanks. You know, So that's a big one. That's a big what's one. That, yeah. What's, what's the takeaway for Thomas? Thomas, Thomas gets promoted. Uh, he gets nicknamed now the Sledge of Nashville. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't get that nickname enough right he's always like rock of chickamauga but right. i always joked if like ecw wanted me to write a uh, thomas biography i'd just call it sledge of nashville <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> get to it get going <laughs> yeah. um in the case of thomas i mean i mean the, the 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 praise just pours in sheridan who was on good terms with thomas uh, send him, sends him a very nice letter. George Meade sends him a great letter as well and orders one of those classic 100-gun salutes into Petersburg. Uh, Lincoln praises him highly and then says, we got to promote him. So does Stanton. And actually, Stanton now becomes one of Thomas's biggest advocates. Um, yeah, in fact, yeah. So Stanton becomes a really, I mean, Stanton becomes really, really confirmed about Thomas. He's a big fan now. Uh, Sherman and Thomas had a complicated relationship. A lot of what I call the, uh, other people I know who uh, really don't like Grant and Sherman will say, oh, Sherman hated Thomas. Like, no, they had a complicated, odd relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you really, and you know, Sherman sometimes would, would, would say bad things about Thomas, but he also would highly praise him. And he kind of sort of, um, in a letter, was telling Grant, like, hey, Thomas is a good general. He's very popular. I wouldn't try to remove this guy. Yeah. Sherman, of course, also sends him an, a letter of effusive praise, you know. And Sherman also will make sure that Thomas has a uh, major command in the South for the rest of the war and then right afterwards. Mm -hmm. However, Grant actually initially opposed his promotion and he and Schofield conspired to take troops away from him. Mm -hmm. So it's, you have this victorious commander who for 1865 is having men taken away. Which is so ironic when you think about Grant in the aftermath of Vicksburg and what Halleck did to take troops away from him as a victorious army commander. That's just a uh, ouch. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh God. I, I really want to like read in detail what happens after Vicksburg. Cause one interesting letter I wrote was just a quick aside that, that there's like, apparently when Lincoln first said, I want to send troops to Texas, Grant said, I don't really want to. And then Lincoln sent him a cold letter. Mm. And then afterwards, Grant said, great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> but, I, but I always give Grant credit for that. He did. He, he, he knew how to serve people like Lincoln, for instance. He wasn't going to talk back to him. At least some of the guys would. But anyway, he didn't hear they're there. He takes away 4th Corps. I'm, no, he take, I'm sorry, not 4th Corps. He takes away 23rd Corps. Schofield very duplicitously got Thomas to send him new troops, but didn't tell him he was going to be taken away so he could have more men when he left. Yeah, Schofield, very sneaky guy. Uh, so all Thomas now has left, and 16th Corps gets sent to go take Mobile. So all Thomas has left is 4th Corps, which you can't really do too many operations in that area with one corps. He does have Wilson's cavalry, and so him and Wilson plan the raid that will cut through Alabama, Georgia, and even some forces going to Florida. And, you know, Wilson's great raid smashes the confederates in the area and of course his men will be the ones who capture jefferson davis mm -hmm. you know? right. um so you know wilson's raid is uh 
know, granted, it's coming at the very end of the war, but it is effective at making sure the war is going to end when it ends and making sure the Confederates in Alabama don't have any second thoughts. Because one thing Thomas and Wilson were very afraid of was that Forrest would turn to partisan warfare. And they, uh, Thomas kind of made it clear, like, if you do that, I will burn down all of Mississippi. You know, and of course, Forrest did eventually say, I'm out. Right, right. Yeah. So, so Wilson's raid, kind of controversial because it came towards the end of the war. But also keeping in mind, when Wilson launches his raid, Petersburg's still Confederate. He doesn't know it's about to fall. Yeah, right. All he knows is Petersburg's still Confederate. You know, Johnston has an army in North Carolina that's at least trying to oppose Sherman. He doesn't have any men Johnston has. And he also knows they're about to attack Mobile and the men who are, men who are going after Mobile will need help. And Wilson's raid does really help out the um, Mobile campaign of 1865. So, you know, he doesn't have, he doesn't have a magic globe, doesn't have Palantir, he doesn't know what's going to happen next, you know. So, yeah, so, but that being said, while Thomas had his troops taken away from him and didn't play as active a role in 1865, Nashville is up there with the march to the sea and Appomattox and determining that the war is going to end when it ends. And his reputation after the Civil War, while of course he's not going to be the as popular or fetid a hero as Grant or Sherman, and some of that's because of his personality, some of that's because he was sent out west to the Pacific. So like, you know, a command that's in the, you know, the, you know, the backwoods, although a very important command, but one that's away from where the newspapers are. Right. You know, but also Thomas died so early. Interesting fact, he apparently died writing a response to Schofield attacking him for his actions <laughs> at Nashville. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. But he died. I mean, he died about, I want to say 1870 or so. Yeah. So he did not go. You know, he was, that, he was he was a Virginian too, and that worked yeah. against him. And uh, you know, disowned by his family, and buried in Troy, New York, with his wife's family. I would say, in some ways, him being a Virginian, I think, helped out. Yeah, because so much of the praise of Thomas, oh, was centered around like you know he stayed loyal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I, I know what you mean. It did, it did hurt him in a bit during the war, but it also did add a, a certain amount of praise that he might not have received otherwise. But yeah, so. It, Maybe he doesn't get as much credit as he should, but the battle does help out his reputation. And I think the fact that he was getting as much pressure as from Grant and he still succeeds stun and stunningly so has really improved his reputation over time. You know, uh, Thomas is one of the more broadly admired commanders of the Civil War. You know, mm -hmm. maybe if, maybe if, if not like super famous, the people who know about him, hold him in high regard. Yeah. And I have yet to meet a guy who's like, you know, Thomas is a bad commander. <laughs> that's true that is true i haven't ever heard that either i mean i've heard it for lee and grant which i don't agree with but i've heard it <laughs> yeah. so let me ask a lot of, well, last question before we wrap up um you know people tend to think of the battle of franklin as the end of affairs out there in tennessee and they overlook the battle of nashville entirely why is it that nashville tends to get forgotten about i think um franklin is Franklin is just a much, much more dramatic battle. I, my nickname for it is Confederate Culloden. You know, the Battle of Culloden in 1746, uh, you know, 1745 Jacobite Rebellion of Bonnie Prince Charlie. It's during the War of the Austrian Succession. It's the last charge of the Scottish Highlanders. So there is, there's like a, um, there's a romance to it, but a really depressing romance to it. Mm -hmm. This is like, the, this is the last charge. And also what the Confederates went through there is absolutely hellish. And so I think that, you know, if, if you're going to be praised, if, 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 and, and we always think of Franklin's usually written about more, I feel like from the Confederate point of view, mm -hmm. because there is, it's, it's a more compelling and sad story. And your average Confederate is going to remember that carnage. It scars them, but they could also write about how heroic they had acted there. Mm -hmm. You don't really have that in Nashville. You lost the defensive fight at a time when the defender usually wins. Hood in his memoirs says that on December 16th, I think um, his words are, for the first time I beheld a Confederate army in like a panicked route. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, and this is Hood. He's been, I mean, he's been at it for a long time. And it isn't that the Confederate veterans didn't write about Nashville, like doing all my Shiloh research, you know, you're going through an issue of Confederate veteran, you'll see random articles. I run into more random articles on Nashville than I expected, just, just 
going through there. But I think some of that's also because Confederate veterans published in Nashville. Yeah. And it seems like a lot, the Army of Tennessee seemed to really send a lot of material to that magazine. But I think the Confederates, they, they did want to, in many cases, forget this battle. And also, you know, Franklin, for many of them, seals the deal. Nashville is like, a, it's, a, it's a mistake. And there's no, uh, there's not enough heroism in it. And it just comes off as a completely tragic waste of life. You know, that's, that'd be my guess. Also, it doesn't help that we don't have a battlefield. Now, we didn't have a battlefield of Franklin either. You know, but Franklin, I mean, I mean, think about that. I mean, Franklin has this hardcore people who are into it. So they've saved some stuff there and it's impressive what they have saved. And then you have the, the, the cemetery that's there as well. Uh, but Nashville, it's practically nothing. I mean, yeah. I say practically nothing. I mean, there are some things that are saved. Some people in the area have done a great job. The Battle of Nashville Preservation Society in particular has done an excellent job. Their website is great, by the way. One of the best battlefield preservation websites I know of. But considering the size of the battle, the scope, we don't have as much. The one thing we have that is impressive, that is saved, is Compton's Hill, also more properly known as Shy's Hill. Most of that hill is preserved. They got a trail. They got a few monuments. They got cannons on top. If anybody's in Nashville, it's always worth visiting that. Very good. Well, the book is They Came Only to Die, The Battle of Nashville by Sean Michael Chick. It'll be out this spring as part of the Emerging Civil War series. And uh, I thought it was just a fantastic book. It was it really shed a lot of light on a battle that I didn't know a whole lot about. Um, so, Sean, thanks very much uh, for talking with us about it. Oh, I was very glad to be here. So Great. Thanks so much for being with us here in the Emerging Civil War podcast. We will see you online and on the battlefield.